University for Ozark Christian College. I want to welcome you to this webinar entitled Top 10 Estate Planning Mistakes and How to Avoid Them. First, perhaps we should talk about what it means by estate planning. The word estate is a legal term to describe all of your assets. Your estate includes personal items like furniture, tools, and antiques. Also, it would include your vehicles, cars, motorcycles, boats, trucks, RVs. Also, it would include your bank accounts, your certificates of deposit, money markets, your investments, your stocks. Of course, it would also include your real estate that you own, like your home, farmland, business, or rental property. All of those types of different types of property are what I mean when I use the word estate. So when we're talking about estate planning, that's simply making a plan to determine what happens to that property when you die or when you're no longer able to care for it yourself. I've been an attorney for over 30 years and I've worked with several families after a loved one has passed away. I've seen some good estate plans and some not so good estate plans. The people with good estate plans provided for their loved ones and the causes they cared about with the least amount of time, effort, and money. Unfortunately, many people did not make estate plans or planned poorly. In this webinar, I wanna share my list of the top 10 estate planning mistakes and how you can avoid them. Number 10 on the list of mistakes, forgetting that God owns our possessions. I want us to consider five biblical principles about stewardship. First, God owns everything. Psalm 24, one tells us, the earth is the Lord and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. We know that God created the universe and therefore he owns everything. He's the owner and we're merely in possession of his property. Our possessions are really God's property, not ours. Second, we must provide for our dependents. First Timothy 5.8 says, if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. God expects us to take care of those people who are dependent upon us. Who are your dependents? Certainly your spouse and minor children are dependent on you. What about your adult children? Are they financially dependent on you? It's possible, but probably not. But what about your church or other ministries that you support on a regular basis? Do they depend on your financial support? Would they miss your giving if you were gone? Yes, I believe they would. When you're gone, those ministries will have to find someone else to make up for your loss in giving. As a result, I think we should consider our church and ministries we support as our dependents. Some people have decided to include the church or ministry they support in the same share that they would give their children. For example, if they had three children, they might include their church and give one fourth to each child and the church. That, to me, is providing for your dependents. Third, our primary motivation should be love. We know from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3, if you give all you possess to the poor and surrender your body to the flames but have not love, you gain nothing. In other words, you can give everything away, even your, lose your life, but if you're not motivated by love, it doesn't matter. We provide for our family and our friends out of love. We give to our church out of love for God and our fellow members. We support missionaries and ministries like Ozark Christian College because we believe in their mission, reaching lost people who've not heard the gospel of Jesus. Our primary motivation has to be because of love. Fourth, it's important to remember that people are more important than possessions. In Luke chapter 15, we find three parables. In the first parable, we hear about the lost sheep that strayed away. The shepherd leaves the 99 behind to go find the lost sheep. Second, we read about the woman who had 10 valuable coins. She lost one and turned her house upside down until she found it. And finally, the third parable is that of the lost son or the prodigal son who left home, his father, waits for him to return, and runs out to meet him. In each parable, something valuable was lost, 
and the owner went to great lengths to find it. These three parables reveal God's heart for the lost. In the same way, we too should be motivated by concern for people. When planning our estate, we're not just distributing our possessions. We are taking care of other people. And finally, stewards will be accountable to the owner. In the parable of the talents found in Matthew chapter 25, we read about a master who asked three servants to take care of his property while he's away. When the master returns, he finds two of the servants have put his property to work and created an increase for the master. He says, well done, good and faithful servants. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Of course, the third servant did not use his master's property, but buried it. The master chastised him for not using it for the master's benefit. We may not want to admit it, but all of us will give account to the owner someday for what we did with his property. So as you can see from these biblical principles, God is the owner and we're in possession of his property. For that reason, we should pray and ask God for wisdom before we make plans about his property when we die. Do you think the owner stops caring what we do with his property once we die? No. Good stewards of God's property should use it for his benefit. Next, number nine on the list of estate planning mistakes, do-it-yourself planning. You can ask my wife about my do-it-yourself home projects. Unfortunately, the results are not very good. So if it's important, we hire an expert to do it correctly. Likewise, when you're making your estate plan, I recommend you hire a professional to achieve the best results. Yes, you can write your own will. However, many homemade wills are invalidated by the courts because they don't meet the legal requirements for witnesses or some other formality. Homemade wills are often written ambiguously and the beneficiaries disagree on their interpretation. I once represented an heir in a probate litigation involving a homemade will. The plan of distribution was not clear and it caused an expensive family fight in court. Also, I don't recommend downloading a will from the internet. Typically, they are one size fit all forms that try to comply with the laws of all 50 states. Does one size fit all? No. The form will contain numerous provisions that don't apply to you, whether you're married or single, older children, younger children, no children. This will just create confusion. And often internet wills are not free. For the price that you pay for an internet lawyer, you could also meet with an attorney to make one for your specific situation that accomplishes all of your intentions and complies with the requirements for your state. Stop and think about it. We're talking about your life savings. We're talking about providing for your loved ones when you're gone. This is not a good place to cut corners. Lawyers make more money in a contested court fight than they would charge you to prepare a simple will. Let me assure you, it's much easier to plan while you're able than compared to unraveling a mess after you're gone. If you care about your loved ones and what happens to your property, meet with an attorney to make an estate plan. Next, number eight, not updating your estate plan is certainly a mistake. If you do have a will or a trust or a plan and it's more than five or 10 years old, it might be out of date. Not because the laws have changed, but because your changes in your life situation. Family members have been married, buried, born, or moved away. New marriages bring new names, new children, new addresses. So it's a good idea every five years or so to review your estate plan documents to see if they are still correct. If they still say what you want, fine, you don't need to change them. But often, circumstances have changed and the plan no longer reflects what you would want. It's very easy to change or update your plans. So if you have not updated your plan or reviewed your plan, uh, I urge you to do so. Number seven on the list of estate planning mistakes, failing to plan for disability. Good estate planning includes more than just preparing for your death. 
A good plan also takes effect when you become physically or mentally incapacitated. Who would you want to care for you and manage your assets if you could not do it yourself? If you do not designate someone to make these decisions for you in the event of your incapacity, a probate judge may have to appoint someone for you. A legal guardian is someone appointed by the court to make decisions for your health and welfare. A conservator is a court appointed person to make to take over your finances and manage your, your money. The guardian and conservator appointed by the court must file an annual report with the court each year that becomes a matter of public record. Of course, there are court costs in obtaining a guardianship and conservatorship order and annual fees paid to the guardian and conservator and the attorney for filing the reports. All of this could be avoided by making a power of attorney. Let me explain what a power of attorney is. While you're still competent and capable, you can sign a power of attorney appointing someone, an agent, to act on your behalf to make medical, financial, and legal decisions for you in the event you can no longer do it yourself. In other words, while you're still able, you appoint someone to act for you if you ever become unable to serve. People are living longer and the risk of being disabled sometime in your life is increasing. Some estimate that one-fourth of 75-year-olds and one-half of 85-year-olds need some type of assistance. A disability can be more financially devastating than death. Nevertheless, disability planning is often ignored. Through careful planning, you can appoint a person to make decisions for you if you're unable. It's also important to note that the authority of your agent under a power of attorney ends when you die. Powers of attorney are only while you're alive, not after you're gone. Number six on the list, improper use of joint ownership. There are different types of joint ownership or owning property with other people. The first type I wanna describe is called tenants in common. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's assume you and I buy a rental house together. You own half, I own half. When I die, I want my half to go to my family and when you die, you want your half to go to your family. With tenants in common, we're 50-50 owners. There's another type of joint ownership that has rights of survivorship. With rights of survivorship, when one of the owners dies, the other half goes to the other owner. This is how it works in most states with property owned as husband and wife. When one die, it automatically goes to the survivor. Single people are often encouraged to add another person on the title of their bank accounts. They want someone who could pay their bills if they were in the hospital or out of town. So I want you to imagine a situation with a widow with five children. She decides to put her oldest son's name on her checking account. When the widow dies, who will receive the money in the checking account? The five kids? No, the one son who's on the account. Does he have to share it with the other four siblings? No, he's the owner. He can say, this is what my mother wanted, I did all the work for her. I took her to the doctor. I took care of her and stayed up with her. She wanted me to have it. Sorry. So you can see there's a potential for problems with joint ownership. It's important to specify whether or not you want there to be rights of survivorship when you have co-owners. If a parent puts a child's name on a piece of real estate, it does not automatically go to the survivor like it does for bank accounts. So how your property is titled is very important, which leads us to number five on our list of estate planning mistakes. No plan to avoid probate. What happens to your property when you die depends on one thing, how it's titled. Property that's in your name only when you die must go through probate court. Let me say that again. Property that's in your name alone when you die must go through probate court. After you die, you're no, long, no longer going to be able to sign the deed, to sign a check, or to sign the car title, right. sign a check. Uh, so your heirs will need a court order to get it out of your name. That's probate court. It's also important to note that wills don't avoid probate. Wills tell probate what to do. Avoiding probate is a common reason people seek the advice of an estate planning attorney. 
the probate process can consume a lot of time, effort, and money. Fortunately, avoiding probate can be accomplished in several ways. We just talked about one way to avoid probate, joint ownership with rights of survivorship. If you add someone to the title of your property, like your spouse or someone else with rights of survivorship, it's no longer in your name only, and it does not go through probate. It'll go to the surviving co-owner. You need to be cautious though, when you do add someone as a co-owner of your account, you're giving up some ownership and certainly control over the property. This can lead to problems. If I put someone else on my bank account, they have access to it immediately. There is another way, a relatively new way of titling property called transfer on death. I can make my bank account to be titled Doug Miller, transfer on death, my two children. While I'm alive, I'm 100% owner of that account and my children have no ownership rights. However, the day I die, 100% of the ownership transfers automatically to the two children without going through probate. All they will need to do is show the bank a certified copy of my death certificate and the bank will give it to them. It does not need to go through probate because it was not titled in my name only. It was titled my name transfer on death at two children. In Missouri, you can title all types of property to transfer on death, real estate, bank accounts, vehicles, investments, stocks. However, not all states recognize transfer on death titling. You need to check with the law in your particular state to know if that's an option. Another way to avoid probate is to create a living trust to own your property. How a trust works is you convey your property from your name only to the trust name. You retitle your assets are no longer in my name, they're owned by the trust. The trust legally owns it and is no longer in your name only, and therefore will not go through probate when you die. You serve as trustee, you appoint yourself as trustee to manage the property while you're alive and competent. Use the property just as you always have. At any time, you can put property in or take property out of the trust name. The only difference is legally, you don't own it, your trust owns it. Then, when you become incapacitated or die, you've designated a successor trustee to manage the trust property and carry out your plans as stated in the trust. So. Uh, if I became incapacitated, my successor trustee would take over, manage the property, pay my bills while I'm alive. And then when I die, my successor trustee will pay my final bills and distribute it to the people that I intended to and the ministries that I've included in my trust. You can see how in that respect, it kind of serves as a will in that it directs the distribution of my property after my death. However, unlike a will, a trust doesn't go through probate. Number four on the list of mistakes, choosing the wrong executor or trustee. As I mentioned with the trust, you select the successor trustee who will manage the trust assets when you no longer can. In the will, you can select your executor. Nowadays, we use the term personal representative instead of executor and executrix. So whether it's a successor trustee, the executor, or the personal representative, this is a person that you've designated, that you've selected to take care of your estate when you die or become incapacitated. They'll pay your final bills and then distributes what's left um, to the beneficiaries you've designated. Obviously, it's important that they keep this their, your money separate from their own. They need to be able to balance a checkbook, keep receipts, and wisely manage the money. Who keeps the trustee honest? The other beneficiaries, they're entitled to know what property that is in the trust and where all the income and expenses went. Obviously, you want to appoint someone as the executor or as the trustee that is willing to serve, that is capable of managing money, and very trustworthy because they have a great deal of authority. So who should you appoint? You could appoint a child, a relative, a friend, Realize your choice of trustee is very important because you could create, unintentionally create conflict in the family. You know your children, you know your family. If they don't get along and you appoint one with authority and one without, there's gonna be conflict and potential for disagreement and fights. 
some banks have trust departments that would could serve as the executor or successor trustee. Bank trust departments have an experienced staff and provide professional management, but they do charge a fee for their services. Regardless of who you select, you want an executor or successor trustee who will carry out your wishes, just as you've put in the document itself. Number three on the list of estate planning mistakes, not coordinating beneficiary designations. You understand life insurance. When you purchase life insurance, you designate who the beneficiaries are who will receive the proceeds of the insurance when you die. Likewise, IRAs, 401ks, annuities, and other retirement accounts often allow you to designate beneficiaries who will receive what remains in the account after you die. Life insurance and retirement accounts can be a substantial part of your estate. You want to make sure they're going to the right beneficiaries at death. The distribution of life insurance, annuities, retirement accounts need to be coordinated with your overall planning objectives to avoid unintentional results. Again, if you just list one child as the beneficiary of your life insurance, there's no requirement that they share that with the other children. If you want it to go to all children, name all of the children as beneficiaries. Problems arise when you don't keep the beneficiaries up to date on your life insurance or retirement accounts. For example, let's say you bought life insurance uh, when you were a single person and you named your parents as a beneficiary. Then you get married and have children, but don't update your beneficiary list with the insurance company. It's important to know who are your beneficiaries on the policy or on the retirement account. If you're not sure who you named as beneficiaries, you should ask the company for a list of the beneficiaries. If you want to change beneficiary designation, you need to ask the company for a change of beneficiary form. It's very easy to do. Simple form in which you say, I want these people to be the beneficiaries. I want this ministry to be the beneficiary of my life insurance or retirement account. Sign it and they will change the beneficiaries. That's how you determine who gets those accounts. And as I said, it could be a substantial amount of money in your retirement account or life insurance. Number two on the list of estate planning mistakes, not minimizing taxes. As you know, there's many kinds of taxes, but I just wanna talk about two. The first one is the estate tax. Some people call the estate tax the death tax or the inheritance tax. Remember your estate includes all of your property, your life insurance, retirement accounts, investments, real estate, everything you own at death. So first, the good news. If your estate is valued at less than $11.5 million when you die, there is zero Missouri or federal estate tax. Now, some states have lower amounts, but Missouri and the federal government uh, have set the mark at $11.5 million, and it keeps creeping up. It's 11.58 this coming year. Now the bad news, if your estate is worth more than $11.5 million, the government will impose an estate tax of 30 to 40% of that amount. It's one of the highest taxes that we have. However, there are opportunities to minimize or eliminate the estate tax. For example, any amount that you leave to a ministry or a charity will not be taxed, will not be included. The estate tax is one reason why Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and other billionaires are giving away their fortunes now while they're alive. They're giving their money to the charities they choose instead of paying federal estate tax to the government. If you want to minimize or eliminate taxes, a gift to a charity like Ozark Christian College or other ministry can reduce or eliminate the amount of tax due. Now I want to talk about income tax for a few minutes. If you own individual retirement accounts, we're talking about traditional IRAs or 401ks, but we're not talking about Roth IRAs. If you own individual retirement accounts, you will owe income tax on the money you withdraw. A good way to avoid that income tax is to make a charity the beneficiary of your retirement accounts at your death. Because nonprofit charities do not pay any income tax, the money will go to the charity tax-free. If you plan to leave an estate gift to Ozark Christian College or your church, it would be very wise to fund those gifts from your retirement account. That's what my wife and I are doing. We're giving our gift to Ozark from our retirement account. 
to save taxes. And if you have an IRA, while you're still alive, you understand that each year after you turn 70 and a half, you have to withdraw some money. The IRS requires it. Because they're concerned about you? Not exactly. Because they want to get the tax? Yes. They're waiting, they've waited until you turn 70 and a half, but now they're ready for their share of the taxes. This withdrawal each year you have to pull out is your required minimum distribution. And you'll owe that, that'll be taxable income to you. However, if you are over 70 and a half, you can direct your IRA administrator to send up to $100,000 per year to a qualified charity like your church or ministry. You will totally avoid income tax on that amount and it counts as your required minimum distribution. Translation, you avoid tax and can give more to charity. That's good stewardship. So if you have an IRA or retirement account, traditional retirement account, you should talk to your tax planner about making a charitable gift directly from your IRA. You don't want to pull it out and then give it. You want to direct your uh, IRA plan administrator to send it directly to the charity so it doesn't come and show up on your income tax. Okay. And finally, the number one estate planning mistake, procrastination. All of us will die someday, and many of us will become incapacitated for some period during our life. However, it's estimated that half of the Americans have not made any plans for death or disability. Unexpected death or disability could occur at any time. When it comes to estate planning, many people simply postpone it. They may be afraid to think about their death. They may think it's too expensive. They may have a family situation that's very complicated. But without a good estate plan, your loved ones will spend a considerable amount of time, effort, and money to settle your estate. You should begin planning your estate while you're able. What happens if you've not made any estate plans when you die? State law will determine what happens to your property. How much money do you think the state will give to your church or other ministry? No, nothing. In your estate plan, you have an opportunity to make an eternal difference. Many people decide to include a gift in their wills to their church or missionary or other ministry. Like many of you, my wife and I um, have decided to give a tithe to our church and Christian ministries while we're alive. Every year, we try to give a tithe. We also plan to give a tithe when we die. In our estate plan, we're giving 10% of our estate to ministries like Ozark Christian College, who are spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. We'll be doing something eternally significant even after we're gone. We think that's good Christian stewardship. I want to challenge you to prayerfully consider including a gift in your will or trust or a retirement account to a church, a missionary, or Christian ministry. Ozark Christian College is establishing the Ozark Legacy Society. Uh, to encourage people to include a gift to Ozark Christian College in their plans. And there'll be more about that in the next coming year. If you have any questions or comments, uh, I left my email address on this slide. Um, feel free to contact me. Thank you for joining our webinar. Uh, I commend you for wanting to be a good steward of what God has entrusted to you. I hope the webinar was helpful and I wanna be a resource for you, please contact me if I can help you in any way. Thank you for your prayerful support of O3.